misconceptions, especially when you're growing up, when you're a school kid, the things that they tell you about Columbus. And one of them was that, you know, well, Columbus was born in 1451. Christopher Columbus was probably of Jewish descent. And in the one DNA study that they did on some of his descendants, um, they did find that they do have a Sephardic gene. So um, he was probably of, of, of Jewish descent. But at that time, when Columbus was alive, you know, there was a reason for him to hide his Jewish descent. Because Sp Spain, in, in 1478, um, Spain had officially begun the, Sp the Spanish Inquisition. So being Jewish was a, a very dangerous thing at that time. Yep. So um, another thing was that when we were kids, they told us that Columbus was the one who wanted to prove that the world was round. The fact is that for over 2,000 years, since the Greeks, they already knew that the world was round. So that's another myth. And um, a German by the name of Martin Behem um, produced the very first globe in 1492. Because with the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks, the land passage to the Far East became extremely dangerous. Therefore, Columbus was looking for a way east by sailing west, because he knew that the world was round. Like I said, everybody already knew that. So Columbus was trying to find the shorter, um, I already said that. Well, Columbus was also on a trade mission. You know, they tell us that Columbus was like, on, like, like basically like they're lost, and then they find this thing, but he was actually on a trade mission. So this is um, <coughs> how the story begins. Um, uh, um, 1492, uh, uh, August the 3rd, the Nina, the Pinto, and the Santa Maria set sail into the unknown, and then they land in the greater Antilles two months later. Took them two months. Now, the people that lived in here, our ancestors, originally came from the Yucatan, from this region over here. And it wasn't a single group that migrated, it was actually a lot of different um, people from different tribes speaking a, a variety of languages, and they made it all the way into Puerto Rico. And this, this trek took them about 2,000 years. So then about 4,000 years later, a group from the Orinoco River Basin, from down here, they began island hopping, and these were Arawakan-speaking people. So it was a mixture of all these different people that gave rise to what Tain, um, Columbus would later encounter, which was the Taino people. So in essence, the Tainos were a mixed blood people to begin with. You know, we were multi-ethnic and multicultural even then, just like we are today. So was it a discovery or was it an invasion? Well, if it was a trade mission, which is what the history book tells us, then why was it that when Columbus landed, he planted a flag and proclaimed everything and everyone that he saw as property of Spain? This is not how you trade, this is how you invade, right? Because if I did that same thing in Macy's, I would go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So over here, and these are just some excerpts from Columbus. Um, he says, I came um, to the Indian Sea where I found um, islands inhabited by men without number, of which I took possession for a most fortunate king. And then on October 17th, 1492, Columbus used the term Indian to describe the inhabitants for the first time. That's the very first time that the word Indian is used to describe the people of, of the New World. Columbus had promised the king and queen that they were going to find a lot of gold, vast amounts of gold and pearls and all kinds of um, riches, but, but the Caribbean had very little gold. So what he did was very quickly, being an entrepreneur, was that he decided that maybe it was better to you know, import slaves uh, into Spain. And on the first trip, they took over 500 slaves with them back to Spain. And then they set up this system called enco enco Encomienda, which basically they gave a, Spanish tr uh, a Spaniard a trusteeship to take over a group of Indians, and these Indians were going to work the land until they died, and in return they would get religion. Okay, so um, uh, an unfair trade. Right? So these are some of the atrocities committed by the Spanish. A lot of these woodcuts are from De Bray, Oviedo, or a number of people. But over here you see it, the Taino people being hunted by masked dogs. That, that that particular one comes from Jamaica. This one over here is Tainos being hung from the hung from the from the mast of the boat. That's shock and awe type of warfare, um, very similar to what they do today, where they bomb a village and then freak everybody out. You know, and they're, they're fighting in the Middle East. And over here, um, this is my favorite woodcut because over here you see a woman, and she's trying to buy back the pieces of her husband, because what happened was that the, the Spanish brought these masked dogs, and those dogs needed to be fed. So what they fed them was um, Taino, Taino people. So Bartolomé de las Casas was a was a was an encomendero who came to the to the Indies to, to make his um, to make his fortune. 
but he saw so many atrocities that in time he became a priest. And um, of all the things that he writes, this is the one that most affects me the most when he says, they took infants from their mother's breast, snatching them by the legs and pitching them a head first against the crag, or snatched them by the arms and threw them into the rivers, roaring with laughter and saying as the babies fell into the water, boil there, you offspring of the devil. So um, the Spanish, like I said, found very little gold, so they began the, the sugarcane sugar cane trade, and with that, the slave trade also. And basically, since the Taino people were dying in great numbers and also running away from the Spanish, what they did was that they started bringing in African slaves. And sadly, Bartolomé de las Casas, who was a, a defender of the Indians, was also the one that condemned the Africans to slavery. Um, for some reason, he saw the humanity in the Indians, but he didn't see the humanity in the Africans. So he, he, um, he suggested that the Africans be, be enslaved instead. So Columbus governs Hispaniola, which is the Dominican Republic in Haiti from 1499 to 1500. Um, and you see those experts there. He is arrested eventually and sent to Spain, but in time he becomes an international hero. And um, at the turn of, uh, of the, marking the 500 year anniversary of Columbus landing in the Dominican Republic, they create this monument to Columbus, which is um, El Fabro Colón. I am happy to tell you that the last time that I was in the Dominican Republic, which is in August, that place has been totally abandoned. Yeah. Nobody goes there. It, yeah. It's falling apart. Yeah. That was the most beautiful sight to me. It looks like it's in ruins. It's, it's really a good thing to see. It really is a good thing to see. Yes. Okay, so um, the, 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 the building was constructed in 1992. Um, the structure is 884 feet tall. It serves as a cultural center, museum, and mausoleum, and it's not used for that. Um, it contains the supposed remains of Columbus. It's contested, though, because some, some people believe that the bones of Columbus's remains are actually in Spain. Some say that it's actually in the Dominican Republic. The building is shaped like a cross to represent the Christianization of the Americas, um, basically the enslavement of the, the Indian people. So, in time, the Taino people are declared extinct. But if the Taino people didn't become extinct, how is it that we have this myth of extinction? Well, that myth has been managed throughout the centuries in, in many different ways. One of the ways that the myth began is that every single time that an Indian became converted to Catholicism, he was no longer considered an Indian. He was not considered a Catholic, right? And so therefore, he wasn't an Indian any longer. But this practice didn't start in the Americas. This practice actually started in, four, in, in 1478 with the official commencement of the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And at that time, what they did was that any Indian, any um, Jew that wanted to escape Torquemada, uh, which was a Spanish uh, um, torturer, basically, if they wanted to, they wanted to escape that fate, then what they did was that they, they, all they had to do was convert to Catholicism. If a Jew became converted to Catholicism, he was called a converso. Uh, a derogatory term for them was also marrano, which means pig-like. Um, and once you were considered, you know, non-Jewish, then now you were a, a, a Spanish uh, uh, vassal, basically, and therefore you were no longer Jewish. This is what happened with the Indians, because you see this rapid reduction in the census records of the Spanish. But I'll tell you, one of the things about the census records that you have to understand is that up until 1750, when the Spanish people were where um, when, when the Spanish were counting censuses, they had this system that they used, which was that they would get on top of a hill and they would spread their arms out like this. And then they would count how many houses there were from tip to tip. And then they would guesstimate how many people were living in, in these houses. And that's how they took their census. Highly um, uh, 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 unlikely, it wasn't scientific, right? It wasn't scientific. Now imagine today, right? Today we have, it's the age of computers. How many legal Haitians are living in the Dominican Republic? We don't know. How many legal Dominicans are living in, in, in Puerto Rico? We don't know. These people don't want to be counted. So how is it that we have definite numbers as to how many Tainos were hiding in, uh, in the mountains of, of the Dominican Republic, Cuba, and Puerto Rico? These islands that are so highly mountainous and the Spanish did not understand that terrain. You know, neither did the Africans that they brought. So these census records give you a very um, distorted view of what was actually happening um, 
and, um, on the islands and what the racial composition was. Another thing is racial admixture, you know? It's, um, it's like, for example, in this country, if you're mixed with African, if you're mixed with black, if you have up to one drop of black blood, you're automatically black. But you have to have over 50% Indian blood to be considered an Indian, right? It only takes one drop of black blood to make you black, but it takes an awful lot of black blo Indian blood to make you Indian. Um, racial admixture deals more with identity. And identity is something that's very personal. You cannot tell people, no matter what degrees of mixture they have, how to identify. That's not the way identity works. And like I already mentioned, was the, the census record in the encomienda system, the Spanish also were hiding Indians. And that, um, and that if you read uh, some of the accounts, what happened is that once the, the Indians were no longer, um, um, were, it was prohibited for Indians to be, to be slaves, um, the Spanish having already encomiendas with hundreds of Indians, they had to set them free, you know? So what did they do? Well, they, they weren't gonna set them free because their, their whole livelihood depended on these Indians and they have to pay taxes for these lands that, they, that they've acquired from the, from, from the king and queen. So therefore what they did was they cheated on their taxes. They said no. What I have here are Africans, they're not actually Indians, you know? And that's one of the ways that they, that they created this myth of extinction. And because of these misconceptions, the, 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 the myth is managed throughout. And if you look at a lot of the Spanish woodcuts of that time period, you'll also find um, a lot of misconceptions and exaggerations. This event here happened on Columbus's first voyage. This was at Samaná, a place called El Golfo de las Flechas, because the very peaceful Tainos that they tell us that they were really peaceful people, well, Columbus was attacked on his first voyage. These, um, these people were called the Ciguayo. They attacked Columbus in Samaná, and over here you see this image of the Taino people eating human beings. This was later used to justify slavery because these people were evil and, um, and cannibals. And also, you can see how this, this woodcut was made, was um, drawn 50 years after the, the fact, uh, after the event actually took place. You count the 11 ships here. At this time, Columbus only had two ships left because the, the Santa Maria had sank off the coast of Haiti. So if you look at the woodcuts of that time period, you'll see that there's a lot of things wrong and, and, a, and a lot of um, assumptions are made based on on, on, the, on the writings and also on these, on, on these things. So, so what do we do? Today what we do is when they tell us that Taino people don't exist, we look for markers of indigeneity. Markers of indigeneity are one of the elements that, that compose any given group, right? <coughs> so you have identity, you have language, oral tradition, customs, religion, material culture, and agricultural practices. You can actually add some more to that, but the other one, the other things you could actually, I could actually be broken down into these. So my work has been looking for these markers of indigeneity across the Caribbean. Um, thankfully, because of my job, I've been able to go into Puerto Rico, into Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and um, it, ama it, it, it amazes me as to just how much um, indigenous culture is actually still there, you know. And, in the, and it's, it's very, very strong, it's very apparent, but the thing is that we're not taught in schools what these things are. Once you learn what these things are, that's when you realize just how much um, influence we actually have. Now, this is the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and these are the mountain ranges of the island. What uh, we have found is that the places where you find the most um, indigenous cultural survival is along these mountain ranges. And when I go to the Dominican Republic to look for, do my work, this is the area that I concentrate in over here. So in the history books, I remember reading one time that it said that uh, in, in, one, in one, uh, one chapter that I read somewhere, it said that the Taino people would burn their crops in an effort to escape the Spanish, and then they would flee into the hills, and then, then they would starve to death in their own country. But at the same time, they tell us that the Africans escaped into the mountains and they survived. So how was it that the Taino who were living in the mountains for, for thousands of years, they weren't able to survive in their own, they couldn't find food in their own homelands, and yet the Africans escaped and actually found food and water, et cetera, et cetera. The only reason why the Africans survived is with Indian help. 
because when people, if right now somebody places you in, 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 any, in any given terrain, you only have days to find food and water. It's not like you think that you have months and months and months, you have only days. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a program called Naked and Afraid, I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, where they take these real hardy people and they put them in these, in these places and within, it, within the first 21 days, a lot of them have already quit. They, you know, you can't survive. And these are people that are trained survivalists. So imagine taking these Africans and putting them in the middle of, of the Caribbean and they escape into the mountains. How were they going to survive? Well, they survived because the people that were already there were amongst them. And this is how the Africans were able to survive. Oh, and another thing that we found too, in the, in the, uh, this here um, is a work of, of, of Enriquillo's war which was the, the only decisive war that the Tainos actually won against the Spaniards, and it lasted 14 years. Um, and, uh, and the very first treaty that was signed between a native nation and a European nation was a result of, 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 in, of Indiquillo's um, revolt and, and his uh, subsequent um, triumph over the Spaniards. So this, this is one of the markers that's very strong to this day, even the Dominican Republic. Um, that is a Ceiba tree, and these are this woodcut is made by Oviedo, a Spanish chronicler. This is a canoe that was um, found in a cave in the Dominican Republic, and this is 1916, 1933, 1992. This one is a special one because this one was found taking sightseers from the Dominican Republic into Puerto Rico. Somehow they got caught by the immigration people. <laughs> but sightseeing. They were sightseeing, right? <laughs> <laughs> they were sightseeing. Fishing. Uh, Jaime is going to give you a demonstration in a little while about how to make the nasas. But these are some of the fishing techniques that we still use to this day, and these are also of, of indigenous um, extraction. Building those, um, those walls called bajareque to trap the fish. The NASA is the, is, the, is the net. Poisoning, we still poison the fish. Some places up in, in Jarabacoa, they still use the poison from the yuca to poison the fish to go fishing. And of course, the corralling of the fish. Over here, the batea. The batea was one upstairs also, as you can see. And the batea is a, um, it's a wooden tray. And you see, this is the Tainos using them in the old days, and this is the way they look today. Still the same thing. Now, this is one of those words that I've always, I've always asked myself uh, when it comes to survival of linguistics, right? Because the first person to describe a batea was Bartolomé de las Casas. And he says, on this island of Hispaniola, the people there, they use these, these trays that we call tornajas o gamellos, but they call them bateas. So think about it. The Spanish had three names for trays, bandeja, tornaja, gamella. And yet, when you go to the campo and you ask people there, what do they call these things? They call them bateas. They don't call them bandejas, they don't call them tornaja, or gamella. That just goes to show you how deep our, our linguistic, the linguistic influence is. Now, the cassava culture, cassava clan. The cassava culture is the, one of the, the, the strongest survival uh, um, uh, elements that have survived. The, the cassave, and I'll give you a demonstration of that later, the cassave is made from the yuca, it's grated and it's turned into, into this, um, this mush called cativilla, and then later on it's put on top of these ovens called buren, and then the cassave is made from, from there. And the, over here, the two top pictures are the, the buren, which is the oven, the Taino oven, and this is the Dominican Republic. Over here, this is a buren in Mexico, this is a buren from the Wayu people, also Arawakan speakers like us, and they also use the very same oven. And, and they're still using the Caribbean. This is cassava bread, for you, also, you that don't know, yuca can get yeah. really big. And this is a place in Jarabacoa, and this is my friend Mechi in Cacique, Atresco Cacique Monción. Uh, people in Cacique are the biggest producers of cassava. Every cassava that you taste here, comes from Monción. Yeah. That strikingly handsome individual there, that's myself. <laughs> um, this is another bread that we make. This is called guayiga. Uh, the bread is called chola. Here is a early depiction of Tainos making guayiga breads. And it's made from the poison samia, mm -hmm. which we call guayiga. And 
we make a bread out of that. It is actually 10 times more poison than the yuca, and from there we also make a bread. And that tradition has also persisted. Native crops like ahi, hobo, batata, guayaba, mapue, mame, chirimoya, hikako, auyama, caimito, leren, guanabana, yabdia, mani, bija, maiz, all the, the crops that are native to the islands have retained their Indian name. And then these are some Taino foods, chen chen, mavi, uh, arepa, uh, mamahuana, ayaca, which is the pasteles, chaca, maiz, cacao, y ajiaco. Uh -huh. All of those are also Taino extractions. And then uh, medicinal plants, from Manamu all the way to Maguey, those who survived, those all those names have survived. We have 52 endemic plants to the islands that are, um, uh, plants that are endemic to the islands, and we still use them for medicines to this day. And then the fauna, the flora, and the place names across the Caribbean have all also, um, there's a lot of invitation there. All in all, we have 3,200 Taino words in the Spanish that we speak in the Caribbean. Now think about it. If you can think of any people across the world that have become extinct and that have left so much just by language, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. The rivers in the Dominican Republic, we had 55 rivers. Of the 55 rivers, only three have Spanish names. The other 52 have Indian names. And mira, que me fue la mano. I did medicinal plants twice. That will not happen again. And by way of religiosity, I'm only just going to touch on it just because uh, a little bit on this because this is really a vast subject. This is what I'm studying now. But in the Dominican Republic, we have this um, this religious, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, um, belief system that's called Agua Dulce or Taimani. And um, the elements that are involved in this are also of indigenous extraction. Um, our baskets, Makuto, Hava, Aikana, Huacales. This is, uh, this is my favorite picture of all my slides. This is my favorite one. This is from Boricay from 1848, um, showing them the people there with their Havas. And this is Huacal. This is Aikana or Argana. And this is some boys in the Dominican Republic riding bulls, and they also have their Arganas there. So La Cesteria también ha sobrevivido, and it's also indigenous. We know that, that, our, that our weaving is indigenous and it's not African because the weave that you see here has been found in fossils in Cuba um, and it's the same exact stitch, the very same exact stitch that we use. By way of music, a lot of our music has retained um, indigenous rhythms. In the Dominican Republic, we have Hakana, Maboba, and Gaga, Oslanda, which is actually Haitian. Mahuita, which is when you whistle like this, that's called Mahuita. And of course, today we have Neo Taino music that the, that the people from Boriken have taken to, to incredible heights today. Siguapa. This is my mom, but she's not a Siguapa. <laughs> that's not the way that was supposed to work out. That explains my features, right? <laughs> but um, my mother was the one who told me everything that I know about, about the campo. I came here when I was um, five years old. And I used to, we used to make cassave in the house. And when my aunts would get together to make cassave, that's where all the stories would fly uh, back and forth about where we come from and the things that the people did. And that's what started me on this path. My mother used to tell us the story about the ciguapa, which is this creature here that I drew. Just to give you an example of it, I realize I'm not an artist, like you guys here. But anyway, but the ciguapa is a creature that has uh, its feet inverted, they point backwards, and it has really long hair. And this creature is said to steal corn and steal salt at night. The people will tell you that there's male ciguapas, there's female ciguapas. Uh, if a ciguapa falls in love with a certain individual, upon its death you're supposed to die as well. I always thought it was a Dominican story. And somewhere along the line, um, some scholars started saying that the story was actually an African story as well. So I got to research and I started looking and then I found that all the Indians of the Circum Caribbean region all have the very same story. In South America, she's called Caipora, Curupia, Duen, or Siguanama. Just like we say Siguapa, they say Siguanama. But it's the same story. So that is exactly an Indian story. This is the village where I come from, Haibon. This is the picture from 1962. This is my grandmother, 
My grandmother had a very strong sense of Indian identity. She died at 104 years old. She was born in 1898. Um, her, her grandmother um, died at 114, so she was actually born in the, in the 1700s. So these stories go back, in my family, they go back pretty far. Contemporary Taino art, well, all of you guys are contemporary Taino artists, so I'm sure you understand, you understand that. Boillos over here, this is a Boillo from Puerto Rico from 1943. Boillo from Cuba from 1956. Boillo from the Dominican Republic in 1992. The Taino house has also survived. Identity, this is where things get tricky. This is my grandmother's passport, where it's listed her color as Indio. This is one of the most ridiculous things that have ever <laughs> occurred to us because um, in, our, in our country they say that um, there are no Indians, but we're all Indian color, yeah. which is to say we're not black. <laughs> you know? But the truth is that that's a double-edged sword. That term kills off the Indian and it also kills off the African because automatically, at that time anyway, you weren't allowed to call Dominicans black. You could only call them Indio. But at the same time, it wasn't an Indian identity. It was just something that had to do with color. Now they've done away with that and they've complicated matters even worse because now they say that, that we are either black, white, or mulatto, but no Indian. You know, so that's, um, pero, how do we know that we have indigenous, indigenous ancestry? Well, one of them was physical anthropologists that already started noticing certain traits amongst people from the Caribbean. I remember back in the old days where a lot of women from the Caribbean, when they would take their babies to, to the doctor, the doctors would always question them about marks that they had in their back. And this mark is called mancha de, uh, mancha, mancha de platano. Um, that's the mongoloid mark. And that, that mongoloid mark um, is um, only Asians and Native Americans have that. that it's, a, it's a patch that, that you have on, the, on your back, like that. Another one is the shovel-shaped incisors. Native American people, and not all Native Americans, but for, uh, like 90% of them have, in, the, in the, four, the first four teeth, the incisors, this scoop that's like a shovel. And usually when you do that, everybody in the audience, except you guys, are going like this to see if they got it too. <laughs> but, um, but that's one of the Indian traits. So we already knew that there were some traits of Indians that were there. But it wasn't until the 1990s that they started doing genetic sequencing in the Caribbean that we found that not only were the people of the Caribbean of, had, not only did the people from the Caribbean have Indian descent, but it's a lot, you know? So um, the mitochondrial DNA studies that were first done in Puerto Rico indicated that the island has 61%, which is very high. The smaller the place, the higher you have in, in, in mitochondrial because the people are mixing among themselves. Like Puerto Ricans, for example, you could, you could basically trace them to five families only across the island, that's, that's pretty amazing. In Aruba, it's 80% of the, of the island. So in the Dominican Republic, it's like 35%, in Cuba, it's like 33%, etc., etc. et cetera. And then these are the phenotypes. And this is a phenotype from Cuba, Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, as you can see. The real strong Indian phenotype is definitely still part of us. Now, I want you to take a look at these people. These are the only people that are, that are listed as Indian in the Caribbean. They're recognized as being Indian. These are the Caribs. These people, um, they call themselves Kalinago. I have to change that. They don't call themselves Caribs. And they, just like, like us, have a, a, a mixture of African Indian and very little white amongst them. But they look very much like us. You know, any of these people could pass for Puerto Rican or pass for Dominican. Look at them. But these are Indians and we are not. You know, these are Taino faces from Haiti. This lady here is um, Maria Len Rock, and she was um, uh, a Taino woman from Haiti. A good friend of mine. She passed away sadly, um, but she was part of the, the, the Native American takeover of Alcatraz back in the 70s. Um, she was an activist, and. Um, Like I said, she sadly she passed away. These are some Taino faces from Cuba. And these are some from the Dominican Republic. And here are some from Puerto Rico. And then we have Taino Revival. So um, in the late 80s, 
people started getting together um, in, in the Bronx, in Manhattan. And a lot of it happened also in the powwow, you know. It's one of these things where people come to an identity that's already there. And part of it was, you know, being in a powwow. I remember being in a powwow and, and listening to this one Puerto Rican girl saying, Ella se parece a Titi Lucy, you know, when they see an Indian walk by. And then you start making these physical connections like that. Um, but the thing was that in, during the 80s, you know, people started getting together, you know, and, and, um, and giving birth to what we call the Taino movement. At the beginning, a lot of Taino people would dress up like North American Indians, and you couldn't tell that they were North, that they were Caribbean people. Um, like I said, the phenotype was that pronounced. This is my youngest son, and he was uh, eight years old, six mm -hmm. months. And um, and then later on, you know, we started recreating um, regalia that was more akin to where we come from. Um, and then now you see the way. It, basically like this now. But the struggle has been reclaiming an identity that for some reason or another is denied to us. Because saying that you're Indian becomes a political statement. You know, I can say that I'm Spanish. I can say that I'm a white Dominican man. And, you know, I'm sure that behind my back they'll say things about that, but nobody will openly question that because everybody knows I speak Spanish, that I have Spanish descent. But the minute that you say that you're Indian, then it's a problem, you know? But the fact is the Taino people did survive. The fact is that we did discover Columbus, he did not discover us. And the fact is that um, this Taino movement that we're a part of is only just beginning and it's just gonna keep on growing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Question.